it may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I deserve knows only how to triumph.
amazing grace. Thank you, Jesus, for that amazing grace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No matter what we might be experiencing, as he said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. That means that with God's help, we can walk through anything. You hear what I said? We're walking through it. We're not staying. Amen. Praise God. We're right. walking on. We're walking on, y'all. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank that you, amazing precious. grace. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to have to find out my chains are gone. Yes. I know it. Well, I looked at that baby yeah. great chain. Was it Michael? All right. I told Michael we didn't know it, but let all we got it together. Oh, okay. Okay. He loves that. We instant him season. We don't mind picking up surprises. Thank you, Lord. Joel chapter 2. What? Joel, Joel chapter 2. trumpet in Zion. Oh, yeah. And sound in the alarm. <laughs> but we'll start with uh, verse 21. And um, hang on just a second. Let me get my soul 
that, you know, I just prayed last night, God, soften hearts, those heart, heart of stone, that it would receive the pure water of God's word. And then as the plant, it, it's bearing fruit. And if you have a garden, you notice that things just kind of slacked off. Well, then this latter rain comes, and everything just gets all green and it's and it yes it'll start blooming again a lot of people pull their plants up i don't i never pull my plants up hallelujah because i have squash till frost because i don't pull mine up okay but don't be pulling your plants up but don't let it go <laughs> that's right next verse and the floors shall be full of wheat. Yes. <laughs> can y'all can y'all picture yes, Homer coming in yes, for a revival? Yes. Woo! Yes. And the fats shall overflow with wine and wool. Keep going. And I will restore to you the years, you, years Lord. that the locust has eaten. And the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Keep going. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Keep going. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Lord. Hallelujah. Keep going. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my yes. spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Yes, and your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Keep going. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Hallelujah. I don't know what's next. Show wonders. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Hallelujah. Yeah, let's go on to the end of the. the yeah, just two. Then sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord, of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be delivered, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. He's calling the remnant. Yes, Amen. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord spoke to me, the, the rain, the rain is coming, the rain is coming. This was before it started raining. And when um, Brandon asked me to take up the offering, I said, Lord, what do I share? And he said, the rain is coming. The rain is coming. That rain's going to bring that last harvest in. That last harvest. We didn't pull up. We didn't pull up our plants. We're going to bring that harvest yes. in. Amen. Amen. You have to sow the seed first. Amen. You have to sow that seed first yes. for the harvest to come. And Lord, we just sow our seed, Lord, into your kingdom. Jesus. And Father, we thank you for the, for the early rain, but we're thanking you for the latter rain. And Lord, in the spirit, we see them coming. We see we see the harvest is coming. We see, Father God, that there's such an unrest in the world. And people are letting that world go. Just let, letting it go. And they're hanging on to you, Father God. They're coming back to you. 
And Father God, just like Reinhardt Bonnke says, I see a blood-washed Africa. Lord, we see a blood-washed Homer. We see a blood-washed Louisiana. We see a blood-washed United States of America. And Lord, we thank you for it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we're going to take up the offering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, while that's all getting together, um, this Saturday night, y'all help me out. This Saturday, we're going to have a, little, a special moment. A Let's special see. moment. Come tell about it. I sure will. I will. Let me talk about it. <laughs> I am so excited for this event. I have not been excited for something um, church related or fellowship related in a really long time. And so my excitement is like full over. I'm like bleeding out. I tell everybody about it. This is going to be huge. I believe this moment is going to be pivotal. There's a word I'm looking for I haven't found yet. I, I'm still searching the dictionary up here. I'm, I'm gonna find it. it yeah, but, but it's it's almost like crucial. This right, this moment, it's gonna change the trajectory of this area, this this territory. The the darkness that has been over, not just the physical darkness I see over the church itself, but the entire area is gonna start to literally right. spread. Yeah. When, when black and white people come together and worship, yeah. did y'all hear what happened a minute ago when we? We were all in one accord singing Amazing Grace for like a second. We all, like, I think everybody in here was on the same note for maybe even a second. And it started thundering so loudly. Like, it's the second we get together, we get together, one body operating as we were designed, just with the sole purpose of being with Jesus or, or just sharing his word, Jesus. The purpose is Jesus. When it happens... There's no choice but for the demons to fall down and to, to run away. Like, it's going to be the light. It's going to be beautiful. And it, you're not going to want to miss out. I mean, well, you have time to come later, I guess, maybe. But you may not. So be there. Be there. Everybody be there Saturday at 6.30 here at the Lighthouse. Place where the light is going to shine for all the world to see. Yes. You don't want to miss it. It's Adrian Willis. Um, I don't know. I don't know proper terms or anything like that, but we have Demetrius and Muffins and Adrian Willis and Duck City be here too, so there. <laughs> can you check my mic? It might be a little bit too high. I don't know why it would be, but... <laughs> All right, welcome to the Lighthouse. Especially since folks haven't been here in a while. Uh, I was going to start in Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2. want the Holy Spirit to come down like that rain is outside of yeah, us. That, yeah, yeah. yes. that would be so preferable. Starting in verse 1. And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. And he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And he shall take there out his handful of the flour thereof and of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. 
You know how few people actually preach or teach that Jesus is related to the Levites himself? Do we not see that early on in the gospel? He was of the sons of Aaron as well. The remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his son. It is the thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. God himself, Jesus of Nazareth, wants that remnant. He wants that remainder. He wants what you've offered on the altar to him. Amen. And he wants to burn up what does not belong in you. Yes. And he wants to take it away. And he wants yes. to raise you to new life in Christ Jesus. Yes. And teach you all things and guide you into all truth and all of the things of the Spirit. Nothing left out. But the thing is, with an offering like that, the old person has to die on the cross with Christ, or they'll never see it. You have to give up the old man. You have to surrender. You have to raise the white flag. You have to Give your life to Jesus. Jesus Christ must be your Lord and Savior and Sovereign God. There must not be any mixture, any combination of allegiances. Someone cannot be connected to a particular philosophy or to an evil spirit, a false god. Right. You have to be 100% devoted to Jesus Christ. Amen. It's the only way to salvation. If thou bring an oblation of a meat offering, bake it in the oven. It shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. Why does it have to be unleavened? Why does it have to be fine? Unleavened is... It's not mixed in with the fat, the fat of the world. Too many keep trying to come to God while mixing in the fat of the world so they never find Him. It's impossible. You can't combine the two. It's one or the other. It's the kingdom of darkness, of the devil, and the kingdom of God. There's no in-between. There's no other option. There's no other way. And fine flour. Flour that has been thoroughly sifted. So often we are prepared, and, and so many say this in their testimonies, they were prepared by God before they came to salvation. And again, I should note, prepared by God, because you can't work your way into heaven. He has to do it. He starts to lead you that way. Um, you know, unlike what Jehovah's Witnesses and others teach, that's not, that's not true. God is willing to sift all of his children in this world and to bring them all to the cross of Christ. He said that he would be raised up, that he would draw all men unto himself. Amen. That's a promise. That's to everybody. It don't matter where you're from or where you're at or what you've done. I'll reiterate. It don't matter what you've done. God wants you. Hallelujah to that because honestly, otherwise, so many of us never would have been saved. Thou shalt part it in pieces and pour oil thereon. It is a meat offering. And if thy oblation be a meat offering, bacon in the frying pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. You know, he keeps talking about this oil and pouring on the oil and anointing it with oil. All of your offerings to the Lord, to those who come to salvation, they should be anointed with the oil that is Christ Jesus, to be covered with God, to be uh, covered with his garment, with his newness of life. There's so many different ways you could go with that, but basically it's that anointing that only comes from God. There are many things that people declare with their mouths, but it's not true. I was a child, 
I did believe in God. I declared him to be my God, but it wasn't true just because I said it. There has to be something else there. It cannot be an empty, vain profession. It has to be deeper than that. That, that confessing the name of the Lord Jesus means more than just saying his name. Because quite frankly, even the devils know he's God and they right. tremble. Right. They know. They tremble. I've seen them. They run scared. They are frightened of him and his holy power. There must be that anointing. And there must be that wonderful oil. The oil is something that's only given to us, to we Christians, in Christ Jesus. It's something that he provides in the work. It doesn't matter what we're doing, where we're going. He's the one who provides that oil. He's the one who provides the spirit. He provides the knowledge, the understanding, the leadership, all of it. He provides our ability to change and become better than what we are. He is the one who provides it all. All the oil comes from him. We basically bring nothing to the table. No, I mean, really nothing, nothing at all. Right. I mean, right. how do I need to put this? When you look at the Bible enough and deep enough and you connect enough of it, you realize that God is always the solution and man is always the problem. Because while we're here, we're imperfect. We were broken in the Garden of Eden. We actually came to the knowledge of evil. I mean, in case anybody's confused about this, we were good. God declared that we were good, and then we ingested the knowledge of evil. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. That which was pure, created by the perfect, holy, righteous, absolute sovereign of all creation, was wonderful and pure and good, just like him. I'm not going to anything weird, but you get what I'm saying, like, he made us perfectly good in the eyes of a perfect being. And then we came to the knowledge of evil. And that broke us. Sure, but think about that for a second. We already had the good. Yeah. That so the only thing that was really added was evil. We didn't become double good. Well, right, right. We, we had to know there was a difference, but there was something other than what we were. That's right. That's right. And, and it's funny, a lot of people don't mention this to the point to where a lot of people seem to think in this inherent goodness of man. There's no inherent goodness in man, not really. There's like a slight poor reflection, slight poor reflection of God's person in every human being. Slight. And it's obviously very broken and very messed up. But there, whenever you see good, it's basically whatever's reflecting him that's still in that person. And people can go too far into that, but there's no real inherent goodness in man himself. We broke ourselves. We turned from God. We disobeyed him. We decided to follow something other than him. We trusted in something other than him, and we were polluted by something that did not come from him. Not true. And we were led to it by the devil, literally, the serpent in the garden. I mean, that happens so much, and folks just don't consider that I mean we're not as naive as Adam and Eve were you know we've been given all this understanding in the word of God and we need to read it and we need to believe it and we need to trust it yes. so that we're not misled like they were there's truly no excuse now because we have a greater Testimony: We have something greater that they did not possess. That those poor people in Sodom and Gomorrah never had the opportunity to know. I mean, honestly, in so many ways, the people before the flood, they didn't really get this stuff. You know what I'm saying? So much more has been revealed since the advent of Jesus Christ, since his death and resurrection, that these people, the ancients, did not have. So God has higher standards for us. Much higher. And thou shalt bring the meat offering that is made of these things unto the Lord. And when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar. 
And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof and shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. God considers it a wonderful and holy thing to bring others who are not saved to the cross of Christ, that they give their souls to Jesus, every part of their being to him, and bow before Jesus Christ as Lord and be saved. It's a beautiful offering, the best offering, a sweet savor to the Lord. And what is left shall be Aaron's. What is left shall belong to the Lord. What is left shall belong to Jesus. When he's changed us, when he's made us new, what remains belongs to him. And he considers us then holy. We become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We don't just say, we don't try, we become. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus did that for us. That was part of his exchange on the cross. That is something you can trust in. And that's something that uh, born again Christians can obviously trust in. If he's willing to burn out these impurities when we come to him in the first place, he'll do it every day. He'll do it every day. It's a continual work. He never wants to stop us. He wants to do that. Every single one of us. Non-stop. To the point where it shocks you to be so much at one. Because I've been there. But that's what God wants. See, no meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven, for ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey in any offering of the Lord made by fire. There's a lot of sacrifice in coming to the Lord in the first place. Yes. There's sacrifice in service to the Lord. There's sacrifice in giving yourself as a living sacrifice to God. He wants to take the leaven out. He doesn't want it to be a part of you. He doesn't want any part of the world to have a part in you. He tells you that. It's not meant for you. That's meant for the people, quite frankly, going to hell. That's not meant for the Christian. He wants to take it all out. For the sinner who's going to hell, he wants to save you and take it all out. Amen. That's a fact. It's undeniable. He's always calling his children to That's a good question. I didn't look that one up. <laughs> but you know, I mean, you think about that. You think about the fat and the honey and other things. Are these really necessary things? Right. So often we add unnecessary things to even what we bring to God. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so but why? You actually brought this up several times before. You know, if it's irrelevant, if it's unnecessary, why? Did, did you have something to say? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Okay, you know, about my sister was a Jehovah's Witness. I, I can't. I can't. You know, I'm about my sister was a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, she's a Jehovah's Witness. So she didn't want me to come and see. You know, it's raining. You never been about my sister. I can walk the church in the rain. And she, what's that? She got married. I don't know. I don't know nothing about it. So. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a completely different thing. A Jehovah's Witness. They, um, they deny Jesus. Um, I mean, they actually claim he's an archangel for some reason, and there's nothing in the Bible that supports it. it it's, it's odd stuff. So a lot of them really don't actually understand Christians and where we're coming from. They don't understand that Jesus Christ is God. Period. We have one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, which is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. He's always been, he's always existed, he always will exist. They're all co-equal. They are all God. Jesus came, he came as God the Savior. He didn't come as a man, as a prophet kind of Savior. You get what I'm saying? Like not a worldly Savior. He came as God the Savior. 
the only one who can truly save the souls of men. The only one who had the power, the authority, <laughs> the decency, the perfection, the ability to fulfill all of those hundreds of prophecies is God himself. It's just so much more proof. Jesus is, I mean, obviously, it's so, well, he, it's so redundant to say some things. It really does. It's like it should be. How can groups like this, you know, not just Jehovah's Witnesses, but any of these groups, how can they say, we believe in this that's in the Old Testament? The Old Testament, you go through all these books, they keep talking about Jesus, 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 Jesus. Nobody else fits with this. Nobody. Because nobody can do it without it. It's impossible to do anything. Well, nobody could have fulfilled these specific things, even in the specific time frame. Jesus of Nazareth is the only one who ever did, truly proving he is God. You can prove he's God from the Old Testament. That's the saddest thing. They just like my sister now. She don't uh, believe in Christmas or Jesus. Right, because she doesn't believe in Jesus, right? Uh, she can, uh, I, I, she'll be here soon. Oh, okay, that's okay. good. That's good. I, I believe Frosty will be preaching Sunday. Okay. Oh, she's got Christmas. Anyway, good. <laughs> As for the oblation of the first fruit. Ye shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from any meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. That's funny. Seasoned with salt. The salt is the covenant of thy God. That seems to be forgotten a lot, but Jesus himself brought it up, right? Uh, if it doesn't have the salt, it'll be cast out. It's not worth keeping. So every offering you make, this is you, this is an individual, this is your Christian work, this is ministry. If it doesn't have the salt of the covenant of God, it's only fit to be cast out. And there's a lot of that today. There's a lot of that today in the world. And quite frankly, we will see more and more of it as the great falling away happens, as things fall apart, as the end comes. We were told this would happen. And it's really sad and weird to see it happen. Rapidly. Rapidly. That's right. Rapidly. And as my brother Paul Bradford's been talking about lately, the great apostasy. He's right. The what? He's calling it the great apostasy, or if you will, great falling away. It's, yeah. We're seeing it. Yep. We're seeing people proclaiming something, but excluding the covenant of God, excluding Jesus of Nazareth, excluding the Holy Spirit. And throwing in everything else, including other spirits. Fruit. Yeah, you have to look at the fruit. You have to look at the fruit. What okay. is it producing? Yeah. And if thou shalt, if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruits green ears of corn dried by the fire even corn beaten out of full ears you know a lot of the time when God's talking about first fruits he's actually talking about people's kids yeah. and folks don't want to teach on that but God's not right. a farmer and he's not a cook right. I, don't, right. I don't know where people are getting these weird ideas from that's too much of literalism he's talking about bringing your kids to Jesus right. How are you going to do that if you're not drying right. the corn by the fire? If you're not bringing them into the presence of God, into his spirit, and into his word and his truth. Yeah. They need right. all that to be yes. saved. That's right. yes. And they need that to be discipled in the faith. It's all yes. the above. That's a very important thing to the Lord. Um, the, the tithe of the first fruits. That's, it always has been. He always said it that way. And that's what he wants. And thou shalt put oil upon it 
and lay frankincense thereon, it is a meat offering for the oil on the children. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof, and part of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Truly, lead all the children to Jesus. <coughs> Tell them about him. Give them a chance to give their lives to him. It's very possible nobody ever did, even inside of a church. Because I've been there. I've been to those churches. I, again, I have friends. They're grown. They're the same age as me or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever did that for them. Not even when they were children. Not even in the church. <coughs> and we'll go from here to Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5. What is this offering made by fire when we're a living sacrifice to the Lord? What does that look like? Be ye therefore followers of God. Nothing else. Just God. As dear children. And walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us. And hath given himself for us an offering. And a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Yeah, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. No pressure. Well, it's not. You don't have to do it. Let but yeah, you, re you lean on Jesus and you rely on Him, dude. Exactly. Because on our own, we can't. Exactly. But in Christ and leaning on Him, yeah, we'll make it happen. That's a living sacrifice. Give yourself like he gave himself. That should be discipleship 101, but I've actually heard churches preach the opposite, telling people not to do ministry work. Weirdest thing ever. It makes no sense. All right? Sacrifice. Give of yourself. Do the work. Do what God himself has commanded you to do. He's given us many of them, many commandments. I mean, the New Testament, um, Acts. You want to see the kind of stuff you probably should be doing? Read the book of Acts. It's a good indicator of what it's like to be that living sacrifice to God. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as become its saints. Not even once. Don't want what someone else has, you know? Don't take what belongs to others. Obviously, don't sleep around in other things. Don't even let it be named once among you. Once. God has the highest standard. It's a perfect saying. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So many people they, they wanna they wanna cuss, they wanna joke, whatever, but they don't want to give thanks to God. And that's part of it. That's part of the life, is giving thanks to God always for all things, even the hard things. And that's not easy. But even when we're suffering, even when he's pushing us and testing us and purifying us and getting the dross off so we're more purified silver, praising him in the moment, thanking him with gratitude in our hearts. That's how to be that living sacrifice. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. God's answer to covetousness, to desire for riches and other things, 
is to call such a person an idolater. Someone who commits idolatry, a horrible, abominable sin. In case anyone's still confused about that, I know there are many. I'll let it go. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. All these different sins he mentions. That's the whole reason God is going to come and pour out his wrath upon those who are not saved. And he says that. He makes it clear. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. It's not meant for you. Why is it not meant for you? For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Wait, who are we proving this to? We already know what's right, technically. God told us. Who are we proving it to? The world. The unbeliever. Even these Muslims who right now are gathering together to slaughter the Christians in Afghanistan. That is who we're proving this to. To show them what they have is empty and vain. And what we have is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Yes. That is a hard lesson to learn. When you're in a place of persecution. Real persecution. But that's where the line, the light shines the most. Yes. It has historically. That happened in Europe. Old dead Europe. They forgot who Jesus even was. They're sent to worship in the Pope. Boom! The light of Christ was delivered to them. The light shined sometimes while they were burning at the stake. And they gave the gospel of Jesus Christ to all these people no matter what. They did not bend. They did not break. They did not quit. And a lot of them sang while they were burning. Yes. They sang hymns while they burned. Yeah. Right? Let us be so set on fire for God yes. that men come to watch us burn. Yes. Come to know our Lord Jesus. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Well, that's a whole lesson all by itself in one verse. Have no fellowship, none, zip, zero. There's absolutely not, not even one time. No fellowship, nothing to do with at all. The unfruitful works of darkness. All these things in the world, all these evil things, everything God says is wrong, never have anything to do with it at all. Even the appearance of evil, as he said in yeah. other scriptures. But expose it. But expose it and reprove it. Say, this is wrong. Stay away from this. Repent. Repent is not a dirty word. No. I mean, if God himself said it out of his own mouth, is a pure and beautiful and wonderful thing. And that is, well, that's, technically that's how Jesus started his ministry. <laughs> Repent. <laughs> Repent. And according to him, again, his standards are so high, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Even this, these wicked things, these wicked people do in secret, it's a shame for us to even talk about. We're certainly not supposed to take part in them. It has nothing to do with us. And God has drawn us out of all of it. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. And to shine His light and prove to them what is acceptable unto the Lord. So when we compromise, and man, there are a lot of a lot of people in the pulpit compromising today. When we compromise, we're telling the sinner, 
It's okay, bro. Just say like that. You'll be fine. That's the opposite of what God said, and they'll probably go to hell. That's not right. We're telling the Christian who's able to be free from everything, all bondage to all sin, all darkness, that he has to stay in his chains of bondage because that's just the way it is. And on the opposite side of that, though, if you can't show, not, you can't just tell somebody. If your, if your life is not a living witness of it, yeah. the love yeah. that comes with it, then, then you will waste your time. It's ineffective. What you say is not going to be it's not going to be lasting unless the Spirit comes in and takes over what you, what you say. You know, you can plant the seed or whatever, but sure. But like, I don't, I don't know, love is staying living. Right? Love is key, but again, why does he say to recruit these things? Because that's part of God's love. That's right. what Jesus Himself right. did. I still, I, yeah, I love this. He goes before thousands of people, and you being evil, right? Who's going to do that today? Great comfort, but not too many other people. I mean, honestly, not not have the the life walk to back it up. Oh, and absolutely. It all the time with them sure. now. But it's it's a it's a point of your life has to be the testimony, or it doesn't. You're wasting it your time. Like there's no there's no point in saying all these words if you can't. Now, if you declare it, like you said, if you declare it, but you live your life in hypocrisy, right. like the opposite right. of that's, this, that's like, it misleads people. Yeah, nobody, yeah. nobody believes that. Sure. Your life doesn't show. There's a lot of that. I mean, I saw that growing up in the churches. I mean, I know. There's a lot of that. I can say to my sister the same thing. And we don't have to be that way, though. When Jesus said repent, he didn't say it softly. No, Jesus did not say repent softly. He's the fellow who always cried out with a loud voice. I mean, he didn't hide in the corner and say, Oh, did they hear that? Uh oh. <laughs> there are a lot of folks who do that today, but no. That's not what God did. He said, repent. It's like, oh. I mean, he went to the religious folks of his day. And again, you have to understand these guys were. By so many standards, very holy. They kept so much of the law. Do you know how hard that is? Yeah. No, I can't. These were not necessarily slouches. They were not necessarily vile men. God told them to repent and to believe. Okay. Everybody needs Jesus or it's over. Mm -hmm. That There you go. Nobody's too holy to where they don't need Jesus to be saved. I mean, there's nobody holier than God. That's nonsense. And obviously everyone, no matter how they've lived their lives, say before they're saved, they all have to repent of their sins and give their lives to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. So, he didn't have like a little asterisk that left out certain groups. You know, the Pharisees or this group here, you, you keep a couple of hundred of the laws, you're good. You're, it doesn't say that. Yeah, there's no merit system. There's no merit system. Oh, yeah, I can go into that. I won't go into that. <laughs> there's no treasury of merit. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It's not there. It's not there. Mary can't save you. Anyway, I'm just going to leave that alone. Okay. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So instead of keeping secrets with a lot of these things, we're supposed to reprove them. We're supposed to openly say, dude, this is wrong. And you start out one-on-one. -on -one. That's actually what the Bible says. You go to someone just personally and say, you shouldn't be doing that, man. I mean, what are you doing? What are you talking about? This is weird, man. What are you doing? And then you maybe bring a couple of your other brothers in the faith with you and you confront them on and say, hey, man, man, you need to stop this. This is wrong. This is... And then you bring it before the church, which doesn't ever seem to happen. <laughs> Not today. But we're supposed to recruit these things. We're supposed to make them known. We're not supposed to keep secrets while somebody's molesting kids. Keep in the mood. Or whatever. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. 
We're not supposed to be keeping those secrets. It's not good for us. It's not good for them. We bring it to light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Those who are asleep, those who haven't been awakened through salvation, God wants to rise them from the dead. He promises that Christ shall give them light. Thank you, Lord. That's a promise. Yeah. Yeah. You look shocked for some reason. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, and entire nations will be drawn to your light. The, the yeah. Gentiles shall be drawn to your light. All these unbelievers will be drawn to your light. And that's true. And it's also true that we're seeing a world covered with gross darkness. Exactly. And we need to shine our light so yeah. they can see it. That's fine. We don't even have light, though. We've got to compel him to be anything. But he puts his light in exactly. you. Exactly. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. That's exactly what I'm getting. That's why he says walk in light. He didn't say walk in light. Even, but somehow it's impossible. He's not walking in light because he's in you. Mm -hmm. yes. Show them Christ in you, the hope of glory. But a lot of times when you shine your light, uh, people talk about people. Yeah. Oh, I know. No, I've, I've had to learn to ignore yeah. a lot of those but things. But when you're happens when you're doing God's work, and it, it there will be things. Really mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. you got to yeah. devil's on challenge. People will come against you when you're shining your light. I've had Christians who seem offended by me sharing the gospel in public. Amen. Yeah, exactly. And I don't even know where they're coming from. That's just too weird. Yeah. Like, I mean, read the Bible, man. I mean, like, what are you talking about? It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John alone speak against that. That's, I don't get it. I don't get it. But anyways, yeah. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, right? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Walk circumspectly, walk with discernment, walk with understanding, seeing things for how they are. Considering God's truth and not the truth as the world sees it. Because the world is blind. The scales have to drop off their eyes before they can even begin to see. What do they have to teach us? And again, there's a lot of these teachings in the churches now coming from that, whether it be any of the critical theories or anything. What do we have to learn from dead men who are going to hell? What do we have to learn from Karl Marx, who's burning right now? Nothing. Reminders of what we were before we were in Christ. That's all you can learn from them. They can only prove to you what is not good and acceptable according to God. True. They're the opposite. Show them the Lord Jesus. Show them his way. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Yep, the days are evil. You know, sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. You will run into these horrible things every single day. Redeem the time wisely. Redeem the time as Jesus did, as the apostles did, as their disciples did, as the early church did, as Billy Graham did. Take your pick. 
it's never changed in that regard. We already know how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to walk every day, shining the light of Christ upon this world. So do it. Just do it. And the light will shine. So you don't have to worry about that. His light will shine out of you. You just do it. Brandon, we can just be out at a store or just out shopping somewhere, just out in public. And if you really want God to use you, yeah. God will lead you to go to specific people. He will point out who he so wants you to go to and ask them if they would like to be prayed for. God will use you in a grocery store or in a corner store or in a liquor store. I've been there. He'll, he'll use you. He'll use you in all these places. Not to go, you know, do the same thing everybody else is doing, but to reach people. Yeah. Although if you're in the grocery store, obviously you're probably shopping, but you get along with that. He'll use you to reach people everywhere you are, where you work, where you just run into folks, um, go into an amusement park with your kids, whatever. He'll use you. He'll use you in a lot of different places. He'll use you in airports. Those are hard places. Nobody wants to listen to anybody there. Nobody <laughs> wants to even look at anybody in an airport a lot of the time. I mean, yeah. But he'll use you there. He'll get yes. someone's attention. He'll blow people's minds right there in the airport. It happens. It happens. He's a multitasker, too. He wants to bless as many people as he can with one situation. So. See, see, God is the ultimate multitasker multitasker when God wants you to do something it might help this one and this one and this one and this one and on and on and on yep. it could be hundreds of people you don't know so just do it <laughs> trusting God because he knows what he's doing because he's perfect and omniscient and knows everything he can make the most foolish thing <laughs> According to the way the world looks at it, it's useful. He can. But vain philosophies like the world provides, like issues the church had with scholasticism in the Middle Ages, that did not actually do the work of God, but turn people away from the truth of God's word. Hey. Yes, and they, it makes such a long, it sounds like it makes such a long lasting effect. Like it still constantly be like, it did. the seeds are just now blossoming from stuff like that. It's like, there are people who don't know other than to think certain ways because of. You're right. There are people who only know to think of certain mm -hmm. ways. They're not getting their theology, if you will, if you will, their doctrines of God. They're not getting them from the Bible. Yeah. But right. the only doctrines of God are in the Bible. Mm -hmm. If the Bible actually does not say this, 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 and this, throw it away. Right. It's nonsense. If you need a modern translation to prove it, probably need to throw that away too. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's good. I mean, you know, if, if you can go to an old King James or a Geneva Bible or whatever else, I mean, a Tyndale Bible, or go back further and further. That's fine, but you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. This weird rewrite that people have done. Oh, it's like it's new international. The new international is weird. Yeah, it's it it's shows a perverted view of God, actually. It's it's understood. God's I mean, word will be understood if you try to. I believe. I believe that the word of God will be understood if you try to. It's universal. It's one. It's sometimes I've seen him. I mean, I, I know a guy in, in prison. Um, He's solidly NLT, but the man knows so much about the Bible and understands so much of it, it blows my mind. Right. And it does because when you talk to him about the very same things, he understands it, even though the NLT says something different. Do you get what I'm saying? Oh, that's yeah. important, it's all about the honesty of what So that does help. I mean, the Spirit of God can lead you into all truth. I'm just saying, it doesn't help when you start out trying to confuse yourself. Now, a lot of people do get confused by this. I know. I see their Facebook quotes, and I'm like, that's not what that means at all. Not at all. It's not even close. So. But yeah, and uh, be not drunk with wine. Well, that's a good one. Wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It'll get you drunk enough. I stay up forever like I'm drunk when I like you last night. 
We had a very nice prayer service last night. The Holy Spirit was very strong here. That was great. It was so good. Michael was, he was there. He, yeah. he went in his room and listened to the Bible app. Tell me he didn't. Because I was drunk and he was like, I don't want to feel like that. Seriously. So that, being in the spirit, right, and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, is much preferable to drinking actual alcohol. Yes, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt the next day, and it doesn't cost you a fortune. I don't know how people can afford that stuff. I'm not joking. Even cigarettes, I'm not just going to go into a big thing. I'm just saying, I don't understand how people afford it. That's expensive. I mean, my dad was a smoker pretty much his whole life, and there was a certain point where he cut back because he couldn't figure out how to afford it. Yeah. It just costs too much. They do. So why pay somebody a lot of money to cause yourself to suffer? He's still working on me, that's why. But when you can have <laughs> the things of God for free that truly improve your life You're right. for free. And giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, anyway, that sounds like one God in three persons. Again. Now, the husbands and the wives part, this is a little bit different tonight because we're talking about the church itself. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. When we even submit ourselves one to another in anything, it should be in the fear of God. We should have the fear of God before our eyes. We should reverence Him. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Right. What God wants, what He says, His truth, His spirit, all of it, His heart, His desire, nothing else. Right. Always in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands <laughs> as unto the Lord. God calls otherwise, people doing otherwise, spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery is one of the worst sins, from what I can tell, in the Bible. God hates spiritual adultery. He does not like us to mix other things in with the Christian faith from anywhere else. And again, there are people, and they are Christian ministers, and they even love God, and they're even safe, but they're still sharing these things that are not of God, and they're trying to mix these things together that don't belong. And it doesn't work. And it leads people astray. It causes confusion for the Christian, and causes the non-Christian, quite frankly, to go to hell through unbelief. They're never saved. They don't get it. They don't know who God is. God clearly tells us who he is that we might all come to salvation. He doesn't make such a complicated scheme that nobody can figure it out. Or we have to earn your way in. Or we have to pay money to get in. Man, there's some weird groups that believe in that. It's just not there. He opened that to all. Salvation to all. Freely. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. When we're worried about the church, who should we be crying out to? Jesus. He's the savior of the body. He's the head of the church. When we're confused about what we should do in anything, who should we ask for guidance? Jesus. Jesus. He is the head of the church. We're not. We couldn't be. <laughs> the scriptures even disprove it. I mean, Christ is the head of the church. We go to him for everything. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. That's a pretty high standard, being subject to Christ in everything. Oh, well, but I'm having a bad day, Lord. I'm not sure I can. 
But I mean, I don't want to offend my family here. But what if these other people, I mean, you know, we, we want more people in our churches. Why don't we go do this thing, right? It would make them happy. But is that what God wants? A lot of things make the world happy that God hates. And he makes it clear, again, all these multitudes of sins. God hates them. He doesn't want us to partake in them. He doesn't ever want us to compromise. There's no... There's no compromise in Christianity that's real. Right. It's always leading people away from God rather than toward Him. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, that it should be holy and without blemish. Holy and without blemish. Sacrificing even himself. That's total dedication right there. We should be totally dedicated to the Lord. No matter the sacrifice. No matter what it costs. And want to present to him a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle. Not having any appearance of evil. And one of the worst things is when I see Christians today. And, and I can, you know, I have to be careful with this too. That just attack the church. We can't do that. Because a lot of these guys are even attacking the basics of the faith. And they're saying all this stuff is evil. I mean, let's be blunt. Right off the bat, homosexuality. That's a big thing today. Right. And a lot of people are compromising on that in these churches. Right. God said it's evil. God said these people need to repent to even come to him in faith in the first place. Yeah. And having met people who have, I see what God can do in them. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to tell anybody it's okay to compromise? And leave them in that, leave them in that darkness. Not just, you know, when they die, they'll go to hell. But even in that suffering, in that living hell in the world today. you got to have faith in knowing that if, if you, God will take you all the, all the nasty out of you eventually. Well, yeah, eventually, eventually God will. Not, but it's, yeah. it's up to us to show those people the same love that everybody else is getting in here in the first place. Exactly. That's sure. what causes the, the watered down so, world we live sure. in now. Like I look past whatever they're because sure, I'm not talking about specific sins or whatever. I mean, I'm like, you know, drag everybody in the church. That's good. Specific sin. That's one of the things. Specific sin. See, I, I, don't, I don't do that either because um, God was very clear. He doesn't like any kind of fornication. He doesn't care exactly. what it is. Exactly. And I don't know why there's such taboo on some. And I don't want to be around them or we don't know about doing my job. You know what I mean? If I don't necessarily wear some people who have different beliefs, yeah. I'm not going to get some. But it, it all depends. You, yeah. you don't stay away from people with different beliefs and, and other weird things. But you don't compromise. You see yeah. what I'm saying? You have to go completely mm -hmm. with what God himself right. says. Right. Because otherwise you can lead them astray. And it's dangerous for them. Like I'm just saying for them. Like I actually worry exactly. about them. I don't even know who them is. is. I'm just saying. You can lead them astray. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. Yeah. I mean it causes them nothing but problems. I mean, particularly, I see these people, some of them, they're, they're children of pastors. Yeah. And they're open, avid homosexuals, and they're saying God loves it and everything, and it's just, no, nope. they've clearly never known Jesus. They don't understand the Bible. They speak against his word, and it's obvious. Yeah. And that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous for them personally. And when they do that, and other people pick it up, it's dangerous for others like them who need to come out of that darkness into the light. I mean, that's just a shame. I always find that sad. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. 
We are joined together, tied together for all eternity with God. God loves and nourishes and cherishes us, his church. He always says he will, that he will build his church, that he will purify it, that he will teach his church, that he will lead his church. He doesn't want us to go any other way. And that can include being in one of these dangerous countries right now where they'll kill you for being a Christian. You can't compromise by proclaiming this false Arab moon god. You can't do it. You just can't. When you compromise like that, you can't then witness to others and have them take it seriously. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the compromise. To save your own life, right? You have to be willing to lay down your own life for the sake of others as Christ did. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you so in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband Love Jesus. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, time, everything. Yes, that's my life. <laughs> Thought life, heart posture, whatever you want to say. Life. Give it all to yes. Jesus. Jesus. And reverence him. Reverence your God. We don't show him due reverence when we make a mockery of him in anything. When we walk in a way that is darkness rather than light. When we compromise on points that the church has always known and believed and promulgated. That God himself did and it's in his word. When we turn from that, we just bring confusion and torment and loss. Nothing good comes from that. It's a poison well. A perfect case in point being... I mean, I'll be blunt. We've seen the problems with the Methodist churches and what they're going through with the homosexual stuff, but there are other things. There are actually a lot of things they're dealing with right now. But they're not supposed to compromise on any of those points. Not this one, not this one. No. If they think that that's okay, they think they're greater than God, they know better than God, they're more righteous than God. That's right about being deceived. Because again, a lot of these people are essentially self-righteous. They think they're more righteous than God by going with some weird thing that God says is actually evil. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not his way. Yeah. Just walk in the light as he is in the light. Mm -hmm. Trust in him, lean in him, do things his way, and shine forth your light unto this dark, dark world. Because there's not a whole lot of it anymore. Yes. I'll go ahead and say it. Um, I, I don't like to talk about stuff I've done because I'm irrelevant. But I've, I've shared the gospel with people in five states and hardly even saw evidence of anybody else doing it at all. Yeah. In five states. 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 Um, the states in America are basically the size of entire other countries. Where is the church? He wants us all to do that. And maybe not all, all at once in every place, but you get what I'm saying. We're all supposed to participate in this because he commanded us all to do it. Go make disciples of all nations. Okay. And people who are making lists. You know, I mean, they, they do the same thing, though. They, they make disciples by their life being a living testimony. But even for the non-evangelists, Jesus didn't limit that to just the evangelist exactly. or to just yeah. the preacher or to just the teacher or to just the prophet or anything else. He said, go. <laughs> so that's, that's all of us. And we used to understand this and agree with it and do it. And that's really when revival broke out. That was many years ago, but that's really when revival broke out. 
Even with the Billy Graham Crusades, he had people going everywhere, grabbing all these unbelievers and dragging them with them to his crusade. Whatever it takes. I mean, whatever it takes. I think that's called kidnapping and hostage. And I'm not talking about actual kidnapping. I did not say to go kidnap people. Oh, Lord. I'm already getting trouble. Uh-oh. I've got a... Prayer request that came in. Yeah. Uh, there's a prayer request that there's came a prayer in. Request. Okay. Okay. It's long. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. From Jack Hibbs. Please pray for the 229 Christian missionaries who've been sentenced to death this afternoon by the Afghan Islamists. Yeah. Let's see, this is where is this Kar- Karagash? Oh, oh, and there's another one. Um, yeah, there's another one. There's an Islamic group that's taken up Karagash, the largest Christian city in Iraq. Pray for them. Pray for them. They're killing hundreds of Christians there. Pray for them. That's yeah. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. All over the place over there. You know, Iraq or Iraq was a very safe place for Christians before Saddam Hussein was killed. Isn't that sad? The man was a tyrant and he was evil, but he didn't attack the Christians like these people did. What do they want? What do they want? Uh, what is that? what is, what that's they... a good question. What, what do they want? Everything? Yeah, they want to conquer the world. Um, Islam shall conquer the world. And if they did, if they were to sure. conquer the what would they do? Kill everybody who's not a Muslim eventually. Okay, and then what? Uh, then they kill each other and create one more faction. I think everybody would be gone. Because they do it right now. It's over there. I just, I just want to end game. Like, what's their goal? Like, what, what they, what they don't you tell me. They're led they by the devil. They want to get everything they can. That, they can exactly. They can't be happy when we get it, so they're the next one. They're led by the devil, so they kill, steal, and destroy. And that might be hard. How dare you talk about this religion? Well, I don't believe in Chris Long. I just believe in Jesus. He's the only way out of this. Except for I have met some very nice Muslim people. I've met some oddly yeah, enough. Yeah, and yeah, some, yeah, oddly yeah, enough, yeah, some are okay with me sharing the gospel in their place. They're, they're open to that. But until they're in Christ Jesus, they will never be saved. Like, it doesn't even matter. I mean, I've got one guy. I'm still confused. I'm not sure if he was a Christian or a Muslim at this point. It was very odd. He kept talking about how he loved Jesus. He was born in Bethlehem. He's actually from there. So I'm still not quite sure what the deal was with that. But the fact is, if you're not a born-again Christian, you don't go to heaven. There's, there's no other way. And when you're outside of Christ, you're going to steal, kill, and destroy like your father, the devil. And not enough people are willing to say that anymore, but it's the truth. If, if they can convince Christians who do love Jesus to, um, they, as in Demons and, and you know, uh-huh. stuff like that, like, yeah. to, they can deceive us and, and this and uh-huh. the other to where we're gossiping and backbiting or just not walking in love. And, people usually do that on their own, gossiping. You know. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know. I don't know. I wait. Jesus is the answer, but I will say a lot of people do that without demonic involvement. Not that they never do that. They're the same right. thing, though, is what I'm saying. They're probably in demons or something. There's no good in them. Right? Well, you got Jesus in you. No, you got the Holy Spirit. I was just saying, like, the Tommy that was two days ago, Tommy. Right. <laughs> she was not nice. She's not a good person. I know. That's what I'm saying. Until, until the, I read the Bible all day yesterday, and then the Holy right. Ghost just breaks me. And... Tommy stepped back and the Holy Spirit in Tommy was what was operating and it was awesome. I have problems with this too, but we do need to understand that we are a truly new creation in Christ. He's made us so completely different that he's literally placed the righteousness and the love of God into us. It's impossible, but it's there because he made it happen. We couldn't do that. He did that. 
Um, so on the one hand, you do have to be careful with things and balance with things and measure with things and not compromising, not doing evil things or wicked or sinful things. But you also don't beat yourself down. And there are a lot of churches full of people who beat themselves all the time. And then even constantly talk about how, you know, they're, they're not saved or whatever and how they have to earn it and all this. That stuff is so weird. I actually don't understand how people can stand it. What is the, uh, it, it's not the Bible where Paul talks about how he cares that um, we're going to be deceived or beguiled like Eve was by the simplicity yes. of Christ? Uh, what, what, what is that? The simplicity of Christ. He's afraid that we're going to be, we're going to lose the simplicity. He is afraid that we're going to lose the simplicity of Christ. I know what you're talking about as far as that goes. Um, and we see that a lot with what people teach today. Their, their Christian teachings are overly complicated, and they lose that simplicity of Christ. They take people away from looking at the cross, from looking at the cross, right. to looking at something over here or something over there. And that actually takes them away from God, further away from God. They actually understand the things of God less. Um, the Spirit of God is with them less, not that he's just necessarily gone, but you get what I'm saying. And you can tell. I mean, a perfect example is like uh, Moody and Tory, um, you know, D.L. Moody and R.A. Tory. They talked about men they knew in the ministry who were filled with certain spiritual gifts. But after a certain point, it's like they lost them. They were gone. I mean, I'm not sure what all happened with them, but you get what I'm saying. They turned away from where God wanted them to be. They stopped being close to Christ, and they lost that gift. He took it away. He's not going to leave a gift with somebody who's going to abuse it or not use it. Actually, I've heard that from other people who said that they didn't use it, and then it went away. Yeah, sure. Being dormant is... It's a waste. It's just as, as offensive, really, because you can't just do nothing with what you got. Well, there's a whole lot of quotes in the Bible on slothfulness, so you're right. Yeah. We, we, we definitely shouldn't remain dormant. Stewardship. Yep. It, it is in 2 Corinthians, though. 2 11. Corinthians 11. 11 3. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, yep. so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's sinful. Jesus. Let's um, yes, Second Corinthians eleven and three. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if he receive another spirit which he have not received. Or another gospel which ye have not accepted, might ye might well bear with him. Yeah, he doesn't want people to go away, yeah, to go away from that simplicity in Christ. And he doesn't want people to receive these other spirits and to accept these other gospels and these other things, this other Jesus. Dude, there's a guy in Brazil who's calling himself Jesus right now, and he's old. He's like old, old. Number one, that should tell you he's not Jesus. Do you really think Jesus is going to sit there and age and die like a normal man? Of course not. That's nonsense. This false Christ. There's so many false Christs in the world. Did Jesus come down and, you know, off the earth and move past his own being and stuff? What do you mean exactly? I don't know exactly the way it says in the Bible, but yeah. he knew how his own be there. Uh -huh. He supposed to came down and walked up, you know, the earth and, you know, see how he's going to be tempted and everything. Or he never did come down. Are you asking if Jesus came down into the earth? Or? Yes. He was born. Yes, born of a virgin. Yes. Right, the Virgin Mary. Okay, so. And he did walk in this earth as fully man and fully God. Yes. And then he preached his word openly, straight face to face with so many people. And again, it's unpopular because the truth of God is unpopular. And he suffered in this world, never once sinning, not even one time. 
and, and all points tempted and yet never sinning, not even once. And he suffered deprivation and starvation and beatings and everything else and died on the cross for people who didn't deserve it at all. We have a lot we can learn from Jesus. And then he, of course, rose from the dead three days later, showing us that in him we have eternal life, proving that he is God, because you can't actually kill God. You get what I'm saying? Like, he was allowed to be dead and actually was dead physically for three days and three nights, and then he rose again. If he was, like, dead, dead, I mean, I'm, you got to be careful of this stuff, but you know what I'm saying. Like, if he was completely dead, could he come back to life? If he was a human, could he do that? If he was a prophet, could, no. God can bring himself back to life. God does not truly die. God has always been and always will be. He's eternal. He's eternal. We do have to be careful the way we handle that, but, I mean, yeah, Jesus is God. He walked in this earth. I'd like to know someone who will know you, but I'd like to add if you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he taught everybody face to face. He didn't withhold anything. He wanted to make sure that people wouldn't be misled like Eve in the garden. He actually spent a lot of time explaining things to his servants that he made. Why did he do that? If we're to be more Christ-like, shouldn't we do the same? I mean, that's just part of it. But don't preach another Jesus, a Jesus without power, a Jesus who isn't God, because that's false. Um, don't preach another gospel. You can get saved by these works. No. You can get saved by these beliefs. No. <laughs> you have to give your life to Jesus. You have to repent of your sins. You have to turn from who you were towards God. You have to truly submit yourself to God. You bow before Jesus Christ as Lord. And when he's your Lord, he will send the Spirit into you. You will be born again. You will be a new creature, a new creation in Christ. You got to be baptized. See, that's the thing. You have to be baptized into Christ. That's not just physical water baptism. I'm, I don't have any problem with the ordinance of water baptism. That's fine. But that's for somebody who already believes. Yeah. You have to be baptized into Christ, into the Spirit of God, and His Spirit into you. You have to be that new creature, that born-again Christian with a new heart and a new spirit. Something completely different. That's when you're saved. Because I, I did water baptism before I was saved. It didn't do anything for me. I mean, like that pastor from Ruston said, it, it just made me a wet devil. I mean, that's part of his testimony. I thought that was hilarious. You know, you get dumped in the water, but that's not the living water that you need for that's salvation. That's to publicly announce where there's water. That is. That's public declaration of your faith. That's one of the reasons for the water baptism. You're publicly declaring to the whole world, I'm a Christian. Come kill me now. I mean, you know, basically. I mean, like I'm not entirely joking because you have to consider they, they've done things that publicly for centuries in Russia and there were times when people would be killed for that. Yeah. But they're openly declaring it to the whole world. Hundreds of people watching. I am a Christian. So they can't deny it later. Right. Right. That's hardcore. I like that. I mean, Billy Graham always said, come declare your faith publicly. Yeah. Right. Publicly. Come to the Lord. Well, the thing that is, is if it's real faith in Jesus, then it's done publicly because you can't help it. Uh, you you can, want to do it, yeah, yeah, yeah openly and publicly, you sure. Can't help it. It just bubbles on out of you. Oh, I know. It's and there is something else that part of what you're saying and what Mom has said. Um, I've gone around sometimes without my scripture shirts, and people are affected the same way. Exactly. I don't know how all that works. I'm not going to claim to, but the Holy Spirit inside of you will do stuff to people, even just being around you sometimes. Oh, my dog's got the Holy Ghost last night. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so. And they're still operating in love today, by the way. So, Brandon, he yes. said, and I don't know if you heard him, that he wants to be baptized. He's a pastor. Well, that's the Jesus. Um, we don't have. 
Yeah, we can no, we can talk about that later. I mean, I don't I don't mind doing baptisms, but we'd have to talk about that later. I don't got any water in there right now. That's just it's just it's gonna take a while to fill up. Yeah, you have to prepare for it. You know, get. Whatever I got to do to get the paper passed, I mean, whatever I got to do to get it inside. Well, we're getting ready to make things right with God. Let's live for Him. Praise God. I know. Anyways, if you want to talk about that, just text me or whatever. Yeah. Okay. We have a baptism. Now let's let's pray. Let's pray for the church overseas. I just got a prayer request. Yeah. Pray for Colleen Thompson. She is in the hospital with COVID and not doing well. Okay. That is uh, is Andrew's, that the landscapers? Yeah. Andrew's oh my boss's goodness. wife. Yeah. Oh. Let's go intensive care too. Uh, Jesus or something like that. Well, let's let's go ahead and, and let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray first and foremost for your suffering children in Iraq yes, and in Afghanistan yes, and in Pakistan, all over the Middle East, holy God, even in Saudi Arabia, as miraculous as it is that they exist. Watch over them. Watch over them, Holy One of Israel. Watch over them. Protect them. Do not let harm come to them unless it is absolutely necessary for the building up of your church. Show them mercy and love and grace and kindness and teach them all the things of God so they can teach them to others and bring them to faith on Jesus Christ. Use them mightily, O oh God, in a land where people still want to believe. Use them for your glory in this world to draw many to the cross of Christ. Even if it's during an execution. But we do pray for them and that you watch over them and that you protect them. Because we do want you to show kindness to our brothers and sisters overseas. Yes, Lord. We do realize it's a hard place. And we pray for Colleen Thompson and others who are in the hospital with COVID, oh God. Heal them completely. Yes, Take all that disease out of them. Yes, God. For, your glory. for your glory, so they can use it for a testimony of what you have done in their lives. Yes. And use them mightily for your work in this world, holy God. Yes. Use us all for your work in this world, holy God. Let us shine brightly as your lights in this dark world. And this we pray in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Amen.